So today we are going to look at Japan's top political events of the year. We have Dan Harada and Timothy Langley joining us. So before we get started, I will introduce our speakers. So Dan Harada is a top flight lobbyist linking foreign executives and diet members in Japan. He is an active member of the Liberal Democratic Party and is one of the few uh, Caucasians among the 1 million Jimin ruling party members. He established the Nagatacho Forum in 1987, has an MBA from Ecole de Commerce, and became a naturalized Japanese citizen in 1987. He is a very much familiar face in the halls of the Diet, and many Diet members recognize his face and his name uh, as they see him. Timothy Langley has 40 years of experience in public affairs in Japan. He is the founder and CEO of Langley Esquire, formerly the general counsel and director of public affairs for Apple Computer Japan and General Motors Asia Pacific. He was the first foreign national to become policy secretary in the Japanese diet to Nakayama Taro, who went on to become foreign minister. He was formerly Far East Trade and Investment Representative for the U.S. Commonwealth of Kentucky and sits on the board and advises various companies, including Fortune 500s, startups, and SMEs in Japan, dealing with their challenges with regulatory issues, government relations, and the like. With that, we'll dive right into the program. So Timothy and Dan, we have a timeline of events and some of the topics that we will cover. Please go ahead. Maybe, Timothy, if you can kick right. us off. Great. Thank you for that introduction, Kelly. Uh, this has been a tumultuous year. The Prime Minister, Prime Minister uh, Kishida, has been Prime Minister for the last 14 months. He started on relatively a high note, uh, 55, 56% approval rating. You might remember that he went through a very tough election campaign within the LDP to become nominated as the president of the LDP and thereby becoming uh, Prime Minister. But it was a tough race. Number two in that was Sanai Takaichi who uh, will come up uh, later in our, our discussions today. But what we're focusing on is what's happening right now, what is going to be happening in the immediate uh, near term. And that's really where the, the, the meat is of this presentation. So I think we can talk a little bit about the Unification Church, the, um, uh, the supplemental budget that was just recently passed, just a really uh, extraordinary, extraordinary session. Um, and uh, a lot has happened as a consequence of that. And it's just been building uh, really incredibly over the last maybe eight weeks or so. Dan? Yes, and the, uh, the support ratio, depending on which newspaper you look at, is around 37, 36, uh, even uh, 35, which is about the level when uh, Sugasan, the, the previous prime minister, was when he stepped down from, from office. Yes, I think uh, both Mr. Abe and Mr. Suga didn't last very long when they were in the low 30s. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the current prime minister has three cabinet resignations within a span of one month. That has not happened in, uh, in recent memory, Dan. That's correct. I don't even think it ever happened. And uh, there are uh, there is another candidate to join the, the three one, and he was lucky because the diet closed, so it made it a little more difficult to fire a, a cabinet member then. But he's still uh, on the lookout. Yes, it looks like uh, the cabinet has closed on the 10th, which was Saturday, about five days ago, and it will um, be started on January 27th. That's a lot of time in between the, the closure of the diet and the start of the new diet. And there is a lot bubbling up. I mentioned uh, uh, Minister Takaichi and her uh, comments in the press talking about the taxes that are being raised or uh, promoted about um, spending for the defense uh, increases. Uh, there's just an awful lot bubbling on, but we can focus on that later. There's a lot of other things to cover now to bring everybody in the audience up to speed on what were the critical events that came about in the uh, current uh, Kishida administration. Dan, you want to talk about the uh, initial uh, cabinet selections that he made? Well, it was a rather standard uh, selection with the balanced and so on. Uh, Kishida Sam himself leads faction number four, four only. And that makes it a little more difficult for him to impose his will on the other followers. 
Now, it's Mr. Kishida's prime minister, but it's also with the former prime minister, Aso, and the secretary general of a party, the trilogy who is uh, running, uh, trying to run the show now. Yeah. Yeah. It's important to kind of look at the um, uh, faction affiliations that are distributed in this uh, initial cabinet. Uh, you'll see that um, Mr. Asso, who was the finance minister and the uh, deputy president or the vice president of the LDP, was replaced by uh, Mr. Suzuki, who is also in the Asso faction. And Mr. Suzuki's father was also a uh, prime minister uh, several administrations ago. Um, but the distribution really marks the distribution of the factions. And um, clearly, the Abe faction is the uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, 98, uh, 97 members compared to number two, which is uh, the Motegi faction, which is hovering around, uh, what, 58 or 57 uh, members, Dan? So here we would like to highlight the three ministers who were replaced. Okay. So we have the Internal Affairs and Communications Minister, Matsumoto. We have the Minister of Justice, Saito, and the Economic Revitalization Minister, Goto, who have replaced uh, previous ministers due to scandal. We will get into this a bit deeper in a moment, but uh, Timothy and Dan, any comments? Well, there, there are three ministers uh, who were fired, but the interesting thing is that they were fired for different reasons. The first one you mentioned was fired because of his links to the church. The uh, second one was fired because he belittled the office of justice minister. And the third one was fired for, for more uh, usual reasons, uh, misappropriation of fund, uh, transfer between public money and private money, etc. So these were the three that went, and I just uh, mentioned earlier, there is a, a number four who is uh, waiting in the wings. It's not just that fourth uh, minister of state. I mean, there are a lot of uh, major politicians who are tainted with this uh, affiliation with the Unification Church. Initially, the prime minister somewhat lukewarmly addressed that issue. There was a lot of public criticism and a demand for the, the uh, prime minister to deal with this and to deal with the, the influence of the Unification Church over the last 40 years within the LDP um, and primarily within uh, the Abe faction, although it spreads uh, very deep and wide. We had expected there to be more of a fallout among ministers because um, it, it really was uh, something that was deeply entrenched in Japanese politics, which was the, the drive of the Unification Church. Um, so there might be other victims uh, in the cabinet that come up um, in, the, in the near term, but I think the, there's so much um, other controversy going on. I think uh, we will move on very quickly after that and um, the Kishida administration will be high on everybody's uh, list of, of um, something to watch very carefully. Thank you, Timothy. We already have a, a question, in fact, asking about who the fourth uh, potential target may be, and we will be addressing this uh, shortly in the slides. So if, if we can move on, we will be talking firstly about the approval of the Economic Security Promotion Act. Now, this is a huge uh, bill that's been passed with uh, big ramifications on policy. As we know, this was enacted on May 11th and went into partial effect as of August 2022 and will reach full effect in May of 2024. The four pillars uh, surrounding this bill are strengthening of supply chains for critical materials, ensuring the security of core infrastructures, promoting the development of key advanced technologies, and keeping the patents on sensitive technologies that could be used for military purposes undisclosed. Now, there are huge policy implications as this uh, in, impacts many sectors, including the finance sector, there's cybersecurity uh, strengthening, there's a, a geopolitical tension that uh, this bill has uh, connotations on. Timothy and Dan, any comments on this bill? No, I think it's it's the time is is very appropriate. It's quite good. I was listening to uh, a speech by the minister in charge of that, 
and uh, she pointed out the, uh, the, the the strengthening of the supply chains for the, the, the critical material. I think it's a well-timed bill and, and at least had, adds to the defense of the nation. Yes, I think, um, you know, while we look at the Kishida administration, there are a lot of things that he was able to achieve. Um, it's easy and it's fun and it's very topical to talk about the mistakes and the challenges that he has. But like Mr. Suga, who came out of the chute after uh, surviving from um, Mr. Abe's administration, he launched the digital agency in record time. It was really a, a great achievement. He had hoped that this would carry his, his administration uh, longer than one year. It didn't quite work out for a lot of different reasons. But when Mr. Kishida came into office, this was his, uh, you know, his his crowning achievement, the um, the security Economic Security Promotion Act, which he did achieve, uh, get it through the diet. There are some other things with regard to the supplemental budget and the, um, the treatment of the Unification Church that he was able to achieve just squeaking through uh, the 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 diet on the in the last minute, but there are other kind of clouds of change that are on the horizon as well. We also had the Quad Leaders meeting in Tokyo. There's been so much going on. I'm not sure if everyone remembers, but in May we had the Quad Leaders Summit with the Australia, India, Japan, and United States leaders joining. Uh, some of the topics of note that they covered were obviously the Ukraine conflict, the launch of the new Indo Pacific. Yep. Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative, uh, which is goal is to uphold a free and open Indo-Pacific. Timothy and Dan, any any comments on this and what we might look forward to? Dan, the, this uh, the the concept of Indo-Pacific was the brainchild, so to speak, of Mr. Abe, and the only thing that I can say here is that's too bad that he's not in the picture. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of people that miss Mr. Abe's president, presence, uh, including Mr. Kishida, at certain times. So the Quad was an initiative that, that grew out of this um, joining of forces of like-minded countries. And it's not just the Quad. There are also the two plus two uh, initiatives that are being conducted, and also the trading of uh, military and the training of forces uh, throughout the Asia Pacific with New Zealand, Australia, uh, South Korea, they had the uh, um, uh, review of forces, naval forces, about uh, three weeks ago. So there's an awful lot going on in the diplomatic and the uh, geopolitical area. There have been some successes there. It's just this march towards uh, what we're going to talk about later, the uh, increase in the defense funding. Next, we will cover a few of the key political happenings. Obviously, we had the House of Counselors election in July. And this was uh, obviously um, right before or right after the Abe assassination, which we will get into in a moment. Uh, but aside from this and, and key political happenings, we had the cabinet reshuffle, the second Kishida cabinet from August 10th. And we also have this resignation domino effect of some of the, the key ministers resigning. Uh, any, any thoughts on this? Well, no, we, we, we just covered it a few minutes ago. All I repeat is that the, the three that stepped down or were stepped down were stepped down for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, it clearly creates the domino effect. And the, the question is who is next and when is next? I think this graph really uh, highlights the fact that the LDP is in a coalition and is an, in a necessary coalition with Cometo. So it doesn't have quite 50% of the um, House of Counselors that it, it needs. The, a lot of people are talking about it needs two thirds uh, to change the constitution. Even before we get to that conversation, there are so many other things that need to be talked about. So this, this um, reliance on Cometo, the LDP is required to kind of fall back a little bit on um, some of the more aggressive stances it wants to take with regard to the economy, with the regard to, um, you know, economic security and also with regard to defense. So this um, this balance, it, it is always shifting when we have elections. There are very few uh, defections that occur during the, the diet sessions, but it's something to watch very carefully when there are, um, you know, people in the, the ministries or in the, um, in the cabinet that 
leave for whatever reason, it does have a, a big impact and it has a reverberation throughout the entire structure that you see in front of you here. Obviously, one of the, the key political events of this year was the assassination of, of Shinzo Abe. As we all know, the former prime minister Shinzo Abe was assassinated on July 8th, 2022. The suspect is Tetsuya Yamagami on the top right, uh, with motivations uh, in the connection to the Unification Church, which led to uh, the domino effect of scandals, which led. Um, on the bottom here, we have uh, Abe's kind of uh, speech within uh, one of their events. As we know, Abe was the longest serving prime minister in Japan's post-war history. He has garnered lots of uh, respect and attention throughout the world for his achievements. Dan and Timothy, yeah. do you have any comments on, on this topic? No, I have no, nothing much to add except the one thing. Uh, Abe son uh, never thought that he uh, would leave as early as he did actually left. And he never was quite clear as to who would, who would succeed him once he's uh, gone. And this is one of the, let's call it problem, which uh, we have currently now. It is a huge problem for Sewakai, the uh, former Abe um, faction. It is still uh, struggling to find a leader to replace uh, Mr. Abe. So it's ruled now by a coalition of several uh, senior members. But Yamagami, in his act of, of uh, revenge for what's happened to him and his family, just really ripped off the lid of what's been going on with the Unification Church and Japanese politics. It has caused just a maelstrom of activity. It has dominated this uh, extraordinary diet and it has prevented uh, the LDP from passing, you know, the majority of the laws that it was proposing because most of the time was spent on, you know, figuring out who was involved with uh, the Unification Church, what kind of tactics and uh, what kind of damage the Unification Church has created, and should it be downlisted from a church to maybe a cult, and that conversation is going on now. But there has been a lot of damage created by the Unification Church that has just been revealed to us as a consequence of this assassination. So diving a bit deeper into the Unification Church scandal, as we know, a string of revelations revealed the LDP's relationship, the Liberal Democratic Party's relationship with this religious organization over quite some time. There's been a few uh, surveys that have been run that have identified these ties. And actually, the Kishida administration responded by pushing for a new bill to crack down on these type of organizations and kind of um, spiritual sales tactics, as it's called, just this past week. Timothy, yeah. Dan, any comments? Well, I... It's just closing the barn's door after the, the horses have gone, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. And uh, I will talk uh, at length after that on the what's up for the Unification Church uh, in the very near future. Yeah, there is still a lot of discussion going on within um, the halls of the Diet and within the ministries who have a uh, um, preview over handling of churches or these kinds of organizations. And it looks like um, it could be delisted, meaning it doesn't have uh, tax benefits as a, uh, a recognized uh, church in Japan. But um, this is a lot of damage that's been done here and more re revelations come out as victims come up on television and in the newspaper to, to talk about their story. So the, the, um, the future is not looking very solid for the Unification Church, but it also spills over to other church-like organizations or actually churches or religions that are established in Japan. So there's a lot of trepidation about how this law will be applied. They just passed it by, um, you know, by hours before the diet ended. I think it was the last bill that they passed. Um, but since it was so rushed and so new, uh, the repercussions and also the refinement of how these things are uh, applied to general uh, church-like organizations is yet to be seen. Then we had the state funeral for the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, this followed the uh, Queen Elizabeth's um, funeral in, in England, uh, but this was held on September 27th. And we have uh, the Yosh uh, Suga Yoshihide, the former Prime Minister that did the, the state funeral speech. Uh, any comments here, Dan and Timothy? Well, I think it was uh, 
obviously very controversial. Uh, I know that Mr. Abe was a, lo a long-serving prime minister, but there were some 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 questions, some of the things he did, and so on and so forth. And I think the, the most critical thing is that uh, Kishida-san went ahead by himself without considering uh, the diet before launching the, the official nationwide uh, funeral for Mr. Abbey. So it was really the way it was done yeah. that it rubbed the people the wrong way. Yeah, I'd like to say two things about the uh, state funeral. Number one, this is the beginning of the uh, downturn for Mr. Kishida. He was on an upswing. He had just finished the election of the upper house. The LDP did well in that election. Um, the day before uh, voting was cast was the assassination. And within five days or four days of the assassination, the prime minister decided, not unilaterally, I mean, he talked with his cabinet and decided that there would be a state funeral in two months time to give people enough time to, you know, state leaders, um, leaders of uh, other countries to come to Japan for this state funeral. And they did in droves. So in that two month period of time though, a lot of other things were coming up. Who is the Unification Church? What are they doing? Why was he assassinated? And that sort of thing. The second thing I'd like to say is um, Mr. Suga as former prime minister at that point in time to do the eulogy of his friend, uh, Mr. Shinzo Abe was so spectacular. And I think it did him really well. His political um, capital really uh, went up. There was a lot of jockeying. A lot of people wanted to have that spotlight. But I think the fact that he did the eulogy and he did it so well uh, stands in his good stead. He is a politician for the long term, and he's not going away just because he was a or is a former prime minister. Uh, he still wields uh, plenty of political power. And now the, the implication of, of Abe's death leads kind of a political vacuum in the Seiwa Seisak Kenkyukai, which is the official name of the Abe faction, still known as the Abe faction, and, and they're leading with a coalition. They are the largest faction of the LDP with 99 members as of November 30th. Uh, they agree, they yield great uh, influence in intra-party decision-making and are still a force to be reckoned with. But without clear leadership, there seems to be a bit of a struggle here. Tim and Dan, any thoughts? Yes. Uh, the, recently, the confrontation between uh, the Prime Minister and Abe faction has become uh, more strong. And the... Uh, it's Mr. Kishida has sort of mishandled the treatment of the faction. So I think the, uh, the the harmony which has prevailed so far between the prime minister and the largest group uh, may go on deteriorating slightly. It sure looks like that. The uh, Sewakai has not been able to come up with the leader. And during the election for uh, for prime minister, um, the largest faction didn't even promote its own um, member, faction member, as a contender for prime minister. And instead, Mr. Abe put his weight behind uh, Sanai Takaichi, who became number two. She she was the second largest vote getter. Uh, Mr. Kishida received the most votes and so became um, prime minister as a result. But as a consequence of that, she's still not a part of the um, Sewakai, the former Abe faction, but uh, they also still not have not um, selected a leader who can, you know, represent the the total voice of Sewakai. I don't know if there is an individual that can the way Mr. Abe did. So uh, the question is, what becomes of of the Sewakai uh, going forward? And I think that they're struggling with that as well. Here is a breakdown of the LDP factions as of November 30th, 2022. Tim and Dan, can you break this down for our audience, the different factions and, and the weight that's held as good. a result? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good slide. Well, I think, yeah, the slide is so good that there's nothing very much to, to talk about again. Uh, essentially, as I said earlier, the, the, 
Japan Inc. is run by the Kishida faction, that's what this is, that's you have, with former Prime Minister Aso at 53 and uh, Motegi-san at 56. So that's the driving force. And you could almost now say practically against the uh, Abe faction. But for the time being, uh, what is on, on the wall here stands and is correct. There is no uh, former uh, Suga faction. It's a rather loose group, but otherwise this, this uh, graph is perfect. Yes, um, I think uh, uh, moving forward in the next, uh, certainly within the next three months, maybe sooner than that, I think you're going to see a realignment. I think uh, probably Mr. Suga will make his play, maybe formally uh, make his own faction. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of forces set up to um, to promote a, uh, a replacement for Mr. Kishida with these numbers and the amount of controversy that's going on. Uh, it's looking awful shaky for him. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so one of the big uh, news stories of this year and, and more in recent in memory is the opening of Japan's borders. Uh, so now we have a lot more foreign tourists coming in. Tim and Dan, any thoughts? Um, no, that's correct. Uh, if you, on the street, the, the scene is different. You've seen a lot of people who do not look uh, Japanese, and uh, whether it's good or not is not, not the question. But you're correct, this is a very important international development for Japan. I think uh, Mr. Kishida really put a lot of weight on this. Uh, there was a lot of controversy about opening the doors, about uh, unmasking. People are allowing people to go um, unmasked. Um, but I think he weighed the continuing negative impact on the economy and just took a chance and opened the doors and allowed that to come in. This um, accommodated also uh, the yen value, which was um, made it easier and, and cheaper for foreigners to come in and visit Japan. So the numbers really uh, went up. They're not enough. It, it's believed to be like a trigger or an activant for more economic development. But even though the doors have opened, the number of people have come in um, you really can't uh, really trigger the economy without the addition of the Chinese tourists coming in, and very, very few of them are coming in. Um, so we really haven't gotten back in step. It'll probably take another two years to do that. But it's a, it's a good thing for the economy, although the economy is suffering from a lot of other uh, ailments as well. Okay, and as we know, the Prime Minister uh, Kishida convened the Extraordinary Diet Session from October 3rd to December 10th. The key priorities were to tackle inflation and a weaker yen, including increasing um, prices. There's been a lot of discussion on raising wages and investing in growing industries. Some notable events include the approval of the second supplementary budget of uh, fiscal year 2022, which was totaled at 28.92 trillion yen, uh, equivalent to roughly $214 billion. The revision of the public offices election law and the new act um, for providing relief for victims of the Unification Church. Any thoughts on this, Timothy and Dan? Uh, no, again, uh, that, what is the on, on the board is correct. The, the Unification Church law uh, was actually passed on a Saturday, which is a very unusual day for the diet to meet. And it was not only on a Saturday, it was on the last Saturday. But I will talk about the uh, not only the, the past regarding the church, but the future, what is in the future for the, this organization. Initiating this um, extraordinary diet session was a great uh, struggle. The opposition party had insisted on it. The prime minister was not so active on it, but he did need to respond about um, the unification church and who was involved. And finally, he relented and uh, launched into the um, extraordinary session. Mr. Hagiuda is uh, the policy affairs chief within the LDP. He's probably number two or number three within the LDP, uh, which is different from the cabinet or from uh, normal um, members of parliament. But he is a heavyweight. He's uh, within the, uh, the leadership council of the Sewakai, the former Abe faction. He went to Taiwan just recently and came back, I think, on Monday. 
um, spending two days there, a very big deal. Um, he is also, he said when we started the, uh, the diet that he wanted to uh, pass 60 bills or 60 bills were going to be uh, promoted and um, discussed, hopefully to be put into, uh, into law. They got nowhere near that because of the controversy. So some people could look at the prime minister as being ineffective during this extraordinary session, but it's been a really extraordinary last three months too. And it looks like it's going to continue to be pretty extraordinary going into the very near term. Great. And finally, uh, closing out uh, kind of our presentation portion, we will cover the all important uh, discussion on the defense budget. So Japan is set to unveil their new national security strategy. This is the revision of three key security documents, including the national security strategy, the national defense program guidelines, and the medium term defense program. This yep. is to be announced shortly, and the key points refer to the extension of the midterm defense program covering five to 10 years, uh, the expansion of the budget to 2%, among other items. This also dovetails into challenges in regional security, uh, including increased tensions with China, the recent uh, behavior of North Korea and the, and the missiles that are increasing, and obviously the Russian conflict with Ukraine. Any comments here, Timothy and Dan? No, I, this is correct. Uh, the only thing you can say is uh, the environment is getting more and more dangerous. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really difficult for the prime minister. It's like him opening a jar with full of full of bees and sticking his hand in it. There's just no good way around it. Uh, some mystical way it happened. He announced that the defense budget would go from one percent to two percent. Up until I mean, for for the longest period of time, twenty thirty years, uh, the defense budget was pegged at one percent, and to talk about it being anything else was taboo. And yet, within the last, I mean, it was talked about recently, but within the last uh, three months, more solidly within the last uh, three weeks. You know, two percent became the, the the policy that Japan was going to follow. Uh, I don't remember a whole lot of discussion on that. It just kind of came up. But the whole geopolitical and the national uh, scene is shifted very considerably. Not just because of economic security and because of North Korea, but there's a lot going on with regard to um, defense spending and inviting not just you know the the, the Americans to be more integrated into Japan's defense, for example, purchasing 500 uh, Tomahawk missiles, very advanced, very expensive uh, weapons to act as defense, but also from the policy perspective, to go beyond what is defensive and to say, we are going to now promote uh, counter-strike ca capabilities. And if you're talking about dual use, you know, counter-strike, it, it could be a, a defensive act, but it, you know, even before you launch a counter-strike, those kinds of um, uh, assets can be used on an offensive basis too. And it's not just them, it's submarines. It's, it's a lot of things that uh, Japan is really going full forward on. And when we talk about that, Mr. Kishida and his faction is more generally pacifist in nature, but the Abe faction, and for a long time, in order to kind of generate this, this um, familiarity that he needed with Mr. Abe and with the Abe faction, he assumed this kind of posture to kind of meld a, um, a, a working relationship. Um, and now it's, it's really difficult because he has decided on the 2%. He's instructed his cabinet to come up with the numbers. The budget will be dealing with that as we move into the new year, but it's causing a lot of controversy how we're gonna pay for this. But it's, uh, it looks like it's pretty much set in stone, Dan. Finally. Yes. Yeah, and tomorrow it will be approved by, by the entire cabinet. Yep. Uh, we'll go into, into the details in a few minutes, but uh, it is on the board for tomorrow. Finally, we have a recent development with a uh, key leader of the LDP uh, visiting Taiwan. So this is quite an interesting development. We have uh, Koichi Hagiuda, who is the LDP's policy chief and former METI minister, uh, visited Taiwan just recently. Uh, Timothy and Dan, any comments on this recent visit? Well, it, it was not as controversial with the Chinese as uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit, but 
it was very not well received within the LDP, not because of any relationship with Taiwan or so on, but uh, Hagiuda san uh, had asked, <laughs> just did it by himself without informing uh, the, his peers, and he rubbed the feathers of a traditional Taiwan LDP uh, group of factions. Yeah, these kinds of things don't happen in a vacuum. Mr. Hagiuda, um, as I said earlier, is one of the uh, chief um, committee leaders within the uh, Abe faction, the Sewakai. When we were talking about, you know, the integration and the, the facilitation of the Unification Church, um, he is one of the individuals that is always talked about because of the, the relationship that he has had, and that's been really pushed in the background. His power is beginning to grow, and the fact that he went to um, to Taiwan to represent Japan, uh, that's a very big deal. It, it hasn't been um, maybe 12 years since somebody at his level has visited Taiwan, and to go at this particular point in time to talk about defense and to talk about semiconductors um, is a very big deal, and it also kind of suggests his, his rising prominence within the LDP and certainly within uh, the Sewakai. So, He's, he's a person to watch, um, and I think he, he, he could be uh, rather controversial, but, um, you know, politicians like him, uh, they don't go away. They're, they're always around and uh, have, um, you know, great attributes to watch. So we will be keenly watching him as well. Thank you very much, Timothy and Dan. With this, we will be moving to an open discussion portion and Q&A, but before we do, uh, I'd like to introduce Langley Esquire's premium membership to our newsletter. We have flagship reports on Policy Radar and Japanese Japan Politics Now, plus other exclusive content such as videos and events such as these, which we will be sharing uh, from next year. So we have an early bird offer right now. Um, so please join us if you would like to uh, learn more and, and uh, keep up to date with political events as they occur. Secondly, Dan Harada does a regular breakfast briefing every month. His next one is going to be Thursday, January 12th at Capitol Hotel. He has excellent uh, briefings, so please join him in person. Uh, please join us, and we will certainly be going and uh, following what Dan has to say about these issues in person. So please contact us, and we will uh, put you in touch with Dan if you do not already have uh, contact with him already. But we look forward to meeting you in person for future events and for Dan's political briefings. With that, we will go into a open discussion session. Uh, there's a few other topics I believe Dan and Timothy would like to cover and talking about the future now. Yeah. We have a few uh, Q&A here, but uh, Timothy and Dan, anything to kick us off? Yes, uh, two things from my uh, standpoint. One thing is uh, which happened yesterday. So the government has the right to investigate uh, Unificant Church, and Minister Nakaoka filed such a request about four or five weeks ago, and yesterday she filed a second request. That is actually a, an order for the church to open all its books. The church has until the 6th of January to actually deliver tons of papers to the, to the ministry. And then it will be the turn for the government to decide whether it passes the baton to the judge and asking the judge to outlaw, uh, not outlaw the church, but rip it off of its tax-free status. So that's number one, uh, and it is yesterday. Number two, and it is tomorrow. It was hinted at a few minutes ago, tomorrow the government will formally launch the so-called five-year plan, defense plan and strategy plan. I'll expand on that in a few minutes. This uh, unification church uh, movement, it's kind of like an Elon, Elon Musk moment, isn't it, Dan? Where they now that, have yes. to, yeah, they have Very to, they have comparison. to, that's right. They have to, they have to reveal and uh, the prosecutors uh, will be very thorough in investigating that. And the dirty laundry will come out, and the people who have been, in, you know, in, invested in the Unification Church, protecting the Unification Church, helping them change their name um, without 
too much fanfare a couple of years ago. There's still a lot of questions about that. And people are sharpening their knives. The opposition camps are unified in trying to attack uh, the LDP and their involvement because they were the ones that really received the lion's share of the benefit of the, um, the sunshine that was shed on them by the Unification Church over the last 50 years. And Dan, do you have any comments on the second round of questions to be taking place, uh, whether we go to a judge and strip the Unification Church of its status, uh, the refund policy or, or other to uh, expect for the rest of the year? I'm a little surprised that there actually is a second round. I thought that the first round would be enough to go to the judge. Yeah. Uh, but I'm surprised. That's about all I can say. But until January 6th, cloud of secrecy, mm -hmm. then the books will be open to everyone. Great. And on the three Bunsho, or the three key bills to be revised, revise, uh, considering kind of national security strategy, uh, there's going to be more discussion on this, I guess, expected tomorrow, uh, December 16th. Um, Dan, do you have any comments on on what to what's to come here? No, the, 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 the cabinet decision will be tomorrow. The diet is not involved in that because the diet is not in session and it's not a matter for for the debate. Uh, but what I want to stress is that we go for 2%. We've been sitting at 1% for ages. Uh, we have a 43 trillion five-year plan. There is, it's already funded except for about 1 trillion, which is igniting the fight, the fact, the fight within Jiminto between the government and the uh, Abe faction. And, and then the last thing which is important is that we call it a, a offense after the fact. But as Timothy said earlier, once you have a missile in place, you, you, you may want to receive the missiles from the from the enemy, or you may want to start your own uh, thing. So that's uh, no good. But also that the the wording in the uh, in the three law or not laws, the three books pillars regarding China is, is enormous. It's enormous. We translating it into English doesn't make any difference. But it must have, oh, he's a, maybe a, a delicate member, but now it's, it's a threat to the entire region. So that is not to be overlooked. Timothy, what do you think? Yes, um, this, this joining of the LDP and Cometo um, in order to get these bills passed, because uh, collectively they hold more than 50%, so they can pass these bills, even if the opposition opposes them. Uh, they are required to pass by both houses, and the LDP and Cometo um, coalition is replicated in both houses. But the 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 farthest that the LDP wanted to go, they couldn't because of the Cometo asking them to to back off. Don't don't threaten China by calling them you know a threat. Let's just say it's a challenge. They did settle on the word challenge rather than threat. But they were pushing very hard for threat in this document that will be released tomorrow. So there are some um, um, breaks in the relationship that are occurring between Cometo and the LDP. Uh, should that happen, um, it could shake up Japanese politics long term. And um, you would find out um, in a, an election of the lower house that could happen any time between now and in the next two years, they're um, required to have an election. Uh, their term ends in about two and a half, uh, two years, uh, but there could be an election, um, and there almost always is uh, before that time runs out. And how this coalition, the forces that keep them together in light of the LDP's desire to challenge uh, you know, China and also North Korea, and Komeito's stance on having a peaceful constitution and you know calming things down. Let's not spend two percent, but if you're going to spend two percent, what's in it for Komeito? Um, so there's a lot of horse trading that's going on uh, behind the scenes. So 
we will see that it will be revealed to us a little bit more gently as time goes on but right now we really don't know all of the details before the the diet reconvenes probably on the 27th of january there is a possibility that kishida san would reshuffle his cabinet mm -hmm. there are many reasons for that but the most important one is to welcome as a minister uh, the head of uh, Kokumin Shinto, Tamagakisa. And clearly for Kometo, this is going to be, well, it's not going to be a shock, they're aware of it, but it's going to be completely redefining the political map which we've had for 20 years. Kometo is about three times as large as Kokumin for the time being, and it is not suggested that they will throw their, will take their votes away from Diminto. But the problem is the church, because let, let's face it, I mean, the, the, the sales techniques and, and the all, all approach of the church is not limited to the church. And everybody knows that Cometo is up, up to it at about the same level as the church was. So you have, and in within Jiminto, you had the what is now what is Abbe faction, who was more attuned, and particularly with Sugasan, to a deal with Cometo. But if you take somebody like Kishta san, if you take somebody like Motegi san. And if you take certain, certainly somebody like Asso, he's a Christian, he, he cannot go on with, with Kometo. Uh, you have two blocks that are competing. And the outlook for Kometo, I don't think, is all that bright. They have moved from 8 million votes to 6 million votes in three elections. And this was before the public is aware, not so much of the unification church, but of the churches in general. So the, the, the future of Cometo looks pretty bleak to me. Yes, it's this is really something, uh, a signal for us to really look at this because should should this uh, kind of distance grow, and it's right what, what you say, Dan, there is no channel of communication as there once was between Cometo and the LDP. That was pretty much dominated by Mr. Abe and uh, you know individuals within the the Abe faction, uh, certain awesome. select in individuals, and now they don't have that that channel. And so things that happen that they don't like, they fester. They they don't get resolved. That people don't come together to talk about them. And um, so the um, the fact that more things are going to come up about the unification church and the criticism about. So Kagakai, that they did the same thing, and this is how they built their political machine, and they collected funds, and they sold these vases full of spiritual, um, all sorts of power as well. It, it could uh, bode very poorly for that coalition. Timothy, oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. I would like to uh, change gears a little bit because okay. we are winding down to the last ten minutes of this program. We have a few Q and A in the chat. Uh, we have a good question from Mr. Eric Lenhart. Uh, he's Hi, asking Eric. about new capitalism. We haven't had a chance to to talk about this too much. Uh, as we all know, the Kishida administration is putting a lot of effort into startups and new capitalism and growth and redistribution. This has changed a little bit. Uh, and now we're talking about the defense budget and increasing taxes. Uh, Timothy and Dan, can you please provide your insight and uh, ideally keep it concise so we can uh, hit more questions and please feel free to drop more questions into the chat. Well, did you see Dan's eyes when the the um, the the term was just mentioned? <laughs> kind of says it all. Now, if my if your question to me is, uh, what do you think about unit capitalism? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> and and Kishida San has been in 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 office for about two years, and he has not been very convincing on explaining what it means. So yeah. I'm sorry, I do I cannot answer. I bail out. Yeah. The Murphy, how about you? <laughs> well, there are a couple of initiatives that um, uh, the prime minister has talked about. Uh, for example, startups, you know, bolstering startups, sending, you know, young entrepreneurs from Japan, you know, a thousand of them 
uh, within the next five years to Silicon Valley and places in the United States to learn through osmosis how to change this. Um, he's dedicated a lot of funds for this, the new startups, but for the new economy, uh, it's really not uh, facilitated by a whole lot of information. And in fact, I think the reason why Dan rolled his eyes is because the prime minister is known as, you know, Kento Chu. I'm thinking about it. I'm going to do it. He talks big. He, he went to London when he be, first became prime minister, had a beautiful speech, and um, I think excited a lot of people. But when he came back to Japan, maybe it's just Japanese politics that just absorbs you, but um, he really wasn't able to get um, a whole lot of uh, wing uh, air between under his wings to launch these things. And I think there, his his administration is pretty much characterized by talking big, but not, not really uh, performing very well. And to change the subject slightly, uh, there are many people now in, in the media and here he, uh, who said the prime minister prides himself he's having a finely tuned ear but he hasn't showed it that so far yes and um moving on to our next question thanks uh, for the question eric we know that the the yen has seen uh, a surge close to 150 and is now kind of uh, settled back down it's at 135.5 we have a question about the current boj governor Kuroda is set to stand down in 2022, and a question on the new governor candidates and interest rate directions. Uh, what can we expect from uh, financial policy? Are there any comments here? We aren't economists, but uh, do you have any comments on what to expect in this space? No, I I'll, turn, I'll turn the answer over to Oh, Tim. thanks a lot, Dan. He's way, way, way better <laughs> qualified than I am to talk about that. Okay, well, uh, I, I can't give any any policy pronouncements, but uh, the fact that the yen has settled down to 135, it was 136, just in, in a little bit of change yesterday. It is settling down. Uh, analysts predict that it will settle down further um, and it will become more stable. Of course, this is all dictated by what's going on in Washington, D.C. Um, and so Japan is somewhat, you know, in, in a difficult place. It, it really can't control that. It did try and supplement uh, the fall of the, the yen. But it did it pretty much by itself. Nobody else really helped them, and they spent a lot of uh, Japanese capital to do that. I don't know if they'll have to do that again, but uh, it looks like it's settling down. And with regard to um, uh, Mr. Kuroda of the Bank of Japan, I think there are three contenders. Uh, there are two that are within um, the Bank of Japan that are colleagues of his, and then there is a, a third candidate who is well-spoken, um, He's a professor. He worked, uh, actually, um, Mr. Kuroda worked under him at the uh, the finance ministry, and he is being touted as also a contender. We're not going to know until we get maybe March, uh, but this individual will be appointed, obviously, by the prime minister at that point in time. Okay, and we have a little bit more time for a few final questions. I'm going to wrap um, two into one. So we have one uh, question on when will Japan drop its silly entry requirements? This limits tourism and international guests and events. And dovetailing that, we have Edward Yagi commenting, you know, over the last 15 years or so, many Japanese universities have become dangerously dependent on students from China, especially graduate programs. So he points to two kinds of risks here, political yep. risks. So China could shut off its flow in part or total in at any time. And there's also strategic risks in that the Chinese students are shifting towards more dynamic English speaking countries. Uh, what do you see hap happening regarding foreign students and foreign faculty, which is actually declining in the years ahead, particularly in uh, some of these spaces, these high tech and um, uh, key sectors that Japan has identified under the Economic Security Promotion Act? Well, I would like to uh, answer that first, but but uh, I don't know if you noticed what Timothy said about the successor to Governor Kuroda that is expected to be announced around the end of March. And uh, Timothy didn't say it will be uh, officially appointed by Mr. Kishida. He said he will be appointed by the Prime Minister. I think it's a quite interesting uh, nuance there. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to, to Timothy because that's not my forte. I really can't tell you about that. Timothy, what do you think? Yeah, thank you for catching that, Dan. Um, with regard to the entry requirements, 
uh, this is an issue that has plagued Japan. It is not just with teachers. It's not just with students. It is also with um, you know high earning um, uh, people in the finance market. Um, Governor Koike has long touted Japan as the financial center for Asia. It's just not going to happen. Uh, people who are fleeing Hong Kong are going to uh, Singapore and not coming to Japan because of the tax um, and inheritance situation here. Uh, the fact that you know English is, is still a bit of a difficulty. Um, you're, you're pretty okay here in certain pockets of Tokyo, but once you get out, um, it's it's really um, uh, not that that comfortable. And also um, to receive the kind of pay that uh, these individuals expect really um, begins to cause a lot of, of controversy within uh, the social and business um, cultures that they're working in. But I think um, you know Japan needs to bring in more people. Uh, Japan acknowledges that, uh, but their immigration policies are really um, a little bit tight. Uh, they could get, be getting tighter. Um, they have the Rapidus um, consortium that is going to be building high-end uh, two nanometer thick wafers um, and that's a going very strong. They've got agreements now to br help um, bring in people from Belgium and, and from uh, England and from other countries to help them do this. They, they need really highly skilled uh, technical people. So understand that it's still chafing uh, for, you know, before it gets to that, that hot senior um, uh, technical and executive level to hit the students and, and the teachers. Uh, great question though, Ed, thank you for um, putting that forward. Thank you very much, Timothy and Dan. Uh, as we round out the hour, it's unfortunate that we have to close out the Q&A portion. We got a great question on also asking about the declining population and this the declining birth rate as well, which will be addressed next year with the establishment of the Ch Children's Agency. Uh, we will continue to watch this and add more commentary on this in the future on diversity incentives and the like. But for today, we will have to close up uh, with this portion of the event. So thank That's you very bad. much for joining us and spending uh, your afternoon with us. Uh, as was mentioned, we have our premium newsletter launched and Dan's uh, next breakfast briefing is Thursday, the 12th of January at the Capitol Hotel. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Timothy and Dan. Thank you. Talk to Thank you, you soon. Thank you, Kelly. Good job. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in.